the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. In this episode, we'll jump forward a little in time to the year 1573. By now, Mary, Queen of Scots, had married and buried Lord Darnley, so to speak, and she had also married Lord Bothwell and abdicated her throne. Mary had, at this point, already been a prisoner of Elizabeth for years. They would number 19 in all, but at this point it was still early on. So let's take a look at what the 19th century observer had to say about Elizabeth's reaction to the Scottish Queen, as well as her favorites, Trouble with a Lady Sheffield. Great as had been the injustice committed by Elizabeth in the detention of the Queen of Scots, it must be confessed that the offense brought with it its own sufficient punishment in the fears, jealousies, and disquiets which it entailed upon her. Where Mary was concerned, the most approved loyalty, the longest course of faithful service, and the truest attachment to the Protestant cause were insufficient pledges to her oppressor of the fidelity of her nobles and ministers. The Earl of Shrewsbury, whom she had deliberately selected from all others to be the keeper of the captive queen, and whose vigilance had now for so long a period baffled all attempts for her deliverance, was, to the last, unable so to establish himself confidence of this sovereign, as to be exempt from such starts of suspicion and fits of displeasure, as kept him in a state of continual apprehension." Feeling with acuteness all the difficulties of his situation, this nobleman judged it expedient to cause Gilbert, Lord Talbot, his eldest son, to remain in close attendance on the motions of the Queen, charging him to study, with unremitting attention, all the intrigues of the court, on which in that day so much depended, and to acquaint him with them frequently and minutely. To this precaution of the Earl's, we owe several extant letters of Lord Talbot, which throw considerable light on the minor incidents of the time. In May 1573, this diligent news gatherer acquaints his father that the Earl of Leicester was much with Her Majesty, that he was more than formally solicitous to please her, and that he was as high in favor as ever, but that two sisters, Lady Sheffield and Lady Frances Howard, were deeply in love with him and at great variance with each other, that the queen was on this account very angry with them and not well displeased with them, and that spies were set upon him. To such open demonstrations of feminine jealousy did this great queen condescend to have recourse. Yet she remained all her life in ignorance of the true state of this affair, which in fact is not perfectly cleared up at the present day. It appears that a criminal intimacy was known to subsist between Leicester and Lady Sheffield, even before the death of her lord, in consequence of which, this event, which was sudden and preceded it, said by violent symptoms, was popularly attributed to the Italian arts of Leicester. During this year, Lady Sheffield bore him a son, whose birth was carefully concealed for fear of giving offense to the queen, though many believed that a private marriage had taken place. Afterwards, he forsook the mother of his child to marry the Countess of Essex, and the deserted lady became the wife of another. In the reign of James IV, many years after the death of Leicester, Sir Robert Dudley, his son, to whom he had left a great part of his fortune, laid claim to the family honors, bringing several witnesses to prove his mother's marriage and among others, his mother herself. This lady declared on oath that Lester, in order to compel her to form that subsequent marriage in his lifetime, which must deprive her of the power of claiming him as her husband, had employed the most violent menaces, and had even attempted her life by a poisonous potion, which had thrown her into an illness, by which she lost her hair and nails. After the production of all the evidence, the heirs of Leicester exerted all their interest to stop proceedings. No great argument of goodness of their cause, and Sir Robert Dudley died without having been able to bring the matter to a legal decision. 
In the next reign, the evidence formally given was reviewed and the title of Duchess Dudley conferred on the widow of Sir Robert. The patent setting forth that the marriage of the Earl of Leicester with Lady Sheffield had been proven. So close were the contrivances, so deep as it appears, the villainies of the celebrated favorite. But his consummate art was unsuccessful in throwing over these and other transactions of his life, a veil of doubt and mystery which time itself has proved unable entirely to remove. Hatton was at this time ill, and Lord Talbot mentions that the Queen went daily to visit him, but that a party with which Lester was thought to cooperate was endeavoring to bring forward Mr. Edward Dyer to supplant him in Her Majesty's favor. This gentleman, it seems, had been for two years in disgrace, and as he had suffered during the same period from a bad state of health, the Queen was made to believe that the continuance of her displeasure was the cause of his malady and that his recovery was, without her pardon, hopeless. This was taking her by the weak side. She loved to imagine herself the dispenser of life and death to her devoted servants, and she immediately dispatched to the sick gentleman a comfortable message, on receipt of which he made whole. The letter writer observes to the honor of Lord Burley that he concerned himself as usual only in state affairs, and suffered all these love matters and petty intrigues to pass without notice before his eyes. All the caution, however, and all the devotedness of this great minister were insufficient to preserve him, on the following occasion, from the unworthy suspicions of his mistress. The Queen of Scots had this year, with difficulty, obtained permission to resort to the baths of Buxton for recovery of her health, and a similar motive led thither at the same time the Lord Treasurer. Elizabeth marked the coincidence, and when a year or two afterwards it occurred for the second time, her displeasure broke forth. She openly accused her minister of seeking occasions of entering into intelligence with Mary by means of the Earl of Shrewsbury and his lady, and it was not without difficulty that he was able to appease her. A similar caution to that of Lord Burley was not observed in the disposal of her daughters by the Countess of Shrewsbury, a woman remarkable above all her contemporaries for a violent, restless, and intriguing spirit and an inordinate thirst of money and of sway. She brought to effect in 1574 a marriage between Elizabeth Cavendish, her daughter by a former husband, and Charles Stuart, brother of Darnley and next to the King of Scots in the order of succession to the crowns of both England and Scotland. Notwithstanding the rooted enmity between Mary and the House of Lennox, this union was supposed to be the result of some private intrigue between the Lady Shrewsbury and the captive Queen, and in consequence of it Elizabeth committed to the custody for some time both the mother of the bride and the unfortunate Countess of Lennox doomed to expediate by such a variety of sufferings the unpardonable offense, in the eyes of Elizabeth, of having given heirs to the British scepters. And that concludes Part 5 in this series, Memoirs of the Court of Queen Elizabeth. We'll continue our story next time. I'm Rebecca Larson. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.